When it comes to attention, I am the enemy. Last night the stars put me in my place, just as they have many times in the past. As I wandered down the hillside beneath my home, I was accompanied by an old dog and a chatty, scattered mind. Then I looked up. As soon as I became aware of how big the universe is, I realized how small I am. There were hundreds of glistening stars putting on a show entitled, You, that's me, are not the center of the universe. Now this is not new information for me. I once asked a former teacher to review a draft manuscript, and he commented on how many times I used the word I in my writing. The other day I was driving home behind a red Plymouth, driven by an older woman with gray hair. Just when we reached the Y in the road before the general store, she went to the left as I took the road to the right. It suddenly dawned on me that this woman had an entire life that would be continuing at the same time as mine. She had problems. She had aches and pains. She laughed at jokes I had never heard before. How was this possible? Even more outrageous was the fact that there were more than five billion people who also had lives of their own. Incredible. My life was only a speck in a rather large crowd. There were also animals and insects and trees and flowers and buildings. This is what we might call perspective, realistic perspective. And if my attention was reality-based, it would reflect such a perspective, but it doesn't. When we begin to seriously study attention, one of the first things we discover is how often our attention is focused on ourselves. Now we're feeling hungry, now thirsty, now we're worried about what's going to happen, now we're tired. Now we're looking around the room, not thinking of others, but thinking, I wonder what they think of me. We notice an item in a store and our reference point is, I could really use one of those. We call a business associate to meet for lunch and our primary concern is, what's most convenient for me? In a recent winter storm, a thousand cattle froze to death, huddling together in an open meadow in a failed attempt to keep warm. And when a reporter interviewed the rancher, his first comments were, we're broke. My needs, my wants, my suffering. It's enough to make you sick. In fact, it does make you sick. In 1990, psychologist Rick Ingram reviewed the research that had been done on the subject of self-focused attention. This research covered problem areas such as depression, anxiety, alcohol abuse, even schizophrenia. In each case, there was an indication of a direct relationship between self-focused attention and the psychological problem. The weight of available data clearly suggests an association between disorder and self-focused attention regardless of the particular disorder, stated Ingram. Other researchers have drawn similar conclusions. A 1982 study of depression found that depressed people refer to themselves more frequently than do non-depressed people even when the normal flow of conversation calls for more attention to the other person. They went on to conclude that evidence also seems to suggest that happiness is associated with an outward focus. Here we have one of the most fundamental and overlooked distinctions in the field of mental health, the contrast between outward attention to the world and attention focused on ourselves. This distinction is a watershed between good and poor mental health, between a healthy flowing mind and a suffering, self-absorbed one. I believe attention, both self-focused and outward, is a skill that we develop in the same way we learn to play the piano. If we practice consistently with the left hand, we become good at playing with our left hand. If we practice with the right, we become good at playing with the right. A good pianist plays well with both hands. But I have much more dexterity with my right hand than my left, and I'm sorry to report that I have much more dexterity attending to myself than to the world around me. I naturally daydream, plan, worry, or do almost anything other than pay attention to what's going on around me at any given moment. 
Nearly all of my students echo this self-diagnosis. We're not out of touch with our inner world, the world of feelings, of preferences, of desires and discomfort. It's a world we know too well. It's a prison which blinds us to a universe of sunsets, spiderwebs, and stars. A universe which is vibrant and breathing with life. The universe wants us to dance, but we're too self-absorbed to hear the invitation. But not all the time. Every once in a while, the beauty of the world is so stunning, so captivating, that we can no longer ignore it, and we forget ourselves and dissolve into something greater. And it's not only beauty which attracts us. It's also need, the needs of a loved one for help, the needs of a community, even a planet. We find our calling, our bliss, our purposes by giving up on ourselves. Our surrender becomes our salvation. Our disappearance provides relief, even for a few moments. But once you've tasted those moments, you've discovered something about attention. And now you can travel through the world and seek out what isn't so obvious. The shadows of birches late in the afternoon, a weed growing in the fissure of a large boulder, the texture of a rose petal against your cheek. You are on your way to becoming a poet. This waking up to the world around us is the foundation of great religious traditions which emphasize service and humility rather than personal success and pride? How do we go beyond ourselves? How do we replace self-pity with compassion for others? What is faith if not a shift of attention? But it's the tragedy of psychology that it is still preoccupied with self-preoccupation. Too often it teaches us to do what we already do too well, pay attention to ourselves. In the course of exploring our pain, our worries, our feelings, and our dreams, we forego the development of a more needed skill to notice and engage the world around us. Without practice, our muscles atrophy. So the next time you find yourself self-absorbed, take a walk. Look around you. The world is an interesting place. It might even give you something to do. If the stars are out, close your eyes. And just listen. You might hear them twinkle. That is how they get your attention. I'd like to finish by sharing a poem with you by Daniel Goleman. It's often a poem that's been misattributed to R.D. Lang. The range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. And because we fail to notice that we fail to notice... There's little we can do to change until we notice how failing to notice shapes our thoughts and deeds. Thanks for taking the time to watch this presentation on attention. On September 20th, I'll be conducting a month-long distance learning program called Working With Your Attention, where you'll have an opportunity to not only learn but practice some of the skills necessary to improve your attention. And in November, I'll be conducting a month of self-reflection also a distance learning course designed to help us reflect on our lives and cultivate an authentic sense of gratitude as we enter the holiday season. I invite you to join me.